Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. We're the fastest growing home health technology company, helping improve care for more than 1.5 million patients and trusted by more than 7,000 healthcare organizations to grow their business. Access is a firm believer in continuing training and we create content so you can learn and grow anywhere, anytime. Let's get started. Access is pleased to present Get ready for Oasis D with confidence to help your clinical managers and field clinicians transition to the new Oasis data set, which is effective January 1st, 2019. Hello, my name is Sean Hamilton. I am the lead clinical product manager here at Access, and I am very excited to present the new Oasis D to you guys. I am coding and OASIS certified with over 24 years of home health experience. Part one of the webinar is to present a regulatory overview and to take a look at some of the revisions to the OASIS D. By the end of this session, you will understand the reason for changes to the OASIS data set and the important initiatives that are impacting home health care today. You will know the comprehensive assessment regulations, be able to identify at a quick glance the changes from OASIS C2 to OASIS D, demonstrate knowledge of the OASIS D item changes, and know how to correctly answer the new questions J1800 and J1900, which are related to falls. So before we begin, it's very important to understand the why. So as clinicians, we all went to school and we had to always know the rationale for the care that we were providing to our patients. So it's ingrained in our brains to understand the why of things. And the OASIS D and the data collection that we are doing, there truly is a reason behind it. So the main initiative that is driving the change to the OASIS data set is the IMPACT Act. And IMPACT stands for Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation. So this was a bipartisan bill that was passed in Congress and signed by President Obama in 2014 as part of the Affordable Care Act. What it does is it gives CMS the ability to look at standardized quality measures across different post-acute care settings because up until this point, there's been a lack of data and an inability for Medicare to measure outcomes across these settings. Now, the post-acute care settings include your long-term care hospitals, the skilled nursing facilities, inpatient rehab facilities, and home health care agencies. The purpose, again, is to improve patient outcomes, improve hospital discharge planning, enable comparable data and quality across the post-acute care settings, and for research. The goal is to establish payment rates according to patient characteristics and not the PAC settings. And that is really the goal of MedPAC. And MedPAC is another group other than CMS that reports to Congress. So here are those cross-setting uh, measures that are present throughout all of the different uh, data collection tools in those PAC settings that I just told you guys about. For us in home health care, it's Oasis D. So it's our skin integrity, the medication reconciliation questions, functional status, major falls, and then the patient preferences. So patient characteristics are some of the major things that uh, Medicare and their, I guess you would say their contractors, like the intermediaries, z -picks, those people, the RACs, these individuals are really focusing on patient characteristics. So it's important now more than ever for our documentation to really identify what our patients are looking like. Another important factor is meaningful measures. So this is very crucial to understanding the why. So in Medicare's calendar year 2019 ruling, they indicated what they call meaningful measures. And they actually put these out in 2017, but they put it in the home health final ruling. 
And these will move payment towards value through focusing everyone's efforts on the same quality areas in, spe in a specific manner. So notice that they said everyone's efforts. So they're not thinking just about home health care, but um, the entire health care continuum. Now let's look at the principles that they identify for these measures. The first one is to address high impact measure areas that safeguard public health. So one, one of the examples is the healthcare associated infections. So now you see that as a part of our conditions of participation through the quality assurance. And in Agency Corps, that is why on assessment, there is a infection risk there so that as clinicians, you can identify if a patient is at risk and then have interventions to mitigate that infection becoming an, an, a problem if they're at risk for infection. So we want to be able to prevent that. And also, this is a part of your um, red indicator that flows to the clinical notes for coordination of care so that everyone knows if a patient is at risk. The next one is uh, patient-centered and meaningful to the patients. So care is personalized and aligned with the patient's goals their end-of-life care planning according to their preferences, and the patient's experience of care. So the patient's experience of care is uh, reflected or collected through the CAPS measures and is reflected as a part of your STAR ratings. And then also functional outcomes. So as we look at the new questions, you will understand more about the measuring the functional outcomes. I also want to say that as far as the end of life measures, it's important for us to collect and understand what the patient's advanced uh, directives are and to facilitate them getting those documents completed. Medicare will pay for a physician visit actually to discuss the patient's preferences, and we just need to make sure that they understand that information. Another uh, measure is that it must be outcome-based where possible, so they want to track measurable outcomes and their impact, fulfill requirements in the program statutes. So some examples of that could be improving access to the rural communities and eliminating disparities. So Medicare definitely understands that um, you know, people with low socioeconomic status are generally those that have those multiple comorbidities and the high uh, risk for rehospitalization because maybe they cannot um, afford their medications and there are things that could be prevented. So um, those are some of the measures they're looking at. And then to minimize the level of burden for providers. And one of the things in the calendar year 2019 that came about is that no longer whenever a recertification is done, a physician no longer um, must identify how long the patient will be on service. That requirement was removed. And as we discussed the Oasis D, um, you will see where they have done a lot of things inside of the Oasis to reduce the burden for us as clinicians in the field. And then significant opportunity for improvement, address measures or needs for population-based payment through alternative payment models. And that, of course, is to reduce costs so that they can protect the Medicare trust fund. That, that's one of the major things that's going on with these meaningful measures. And then to align across programs and or with other pairs, such as Medicaid and commercial pairs. So Medicare also have several initiatives going on at this present time and also coming soon that affect home health care, which make documentation even more important. Now, I will not discuss each of these as each one is a 30-minute webinar in and of itself, but they include your home health value-based purchasing, the review choice demonstration, targeted probe and educate, the Impact Act of 2014, and then the Patient Directed Group and Model, PDGM, which is coming in 2020. And of course, here at Access, we will do a lot of training as that is a totally different new uh, payment model for agencies.
But what I want you to understand is that the common thread for all of these is clinical documentation, which begins with the OASIS assessment. And in Agency Corps, we have you covered. Um, the documentation to be compliant is there. And so if you guys have any questions about documentation, please do give us a call, send us an email, and we will be more than willing to help. Now, let's review the 2018 Medicare Condition of Participation rulings regarding the comprehensive assessment. So the COPs require that each patient must receive and an agency must provide a patient-specific comprehensive assessment. So again, they're being clear that we can no longer have these canned statements and check boxes. We have to individualize the patient care. It doesn't mean that your interventions won't be the same, but you just have to make it more measurable that for this patient, I'm trying to get them from point A to C, and maybe for another patient, I have to get them from A through F. So we just have to be more specific in our documentation. So also for Medicare beneficiaries, the agency must verify the patient's eligibility for the Medicare home health benefit, including their homebound status. So as a side note, the persistent reasons for denial of claims remain inadequate face-to-face -face documentation, homebound status, and medical necessity or a need for skilled care. In Agency Corps, we prompt you guys to complete this documentation in the OASIS to prevent rejected claims. Remember, you cannot have check boxes for homebound status. You must relate the patient's homebound status to their functional deficits. So that is why we have those prompts there to help you out. The comprehensive OASIS assessment must be completed in a timely manner and is consistent with the patient's immediate care needs. The start of care date equals day zero and is the date of the first billable visit. So the OASIS assessment shall not be completed later than five days after the start of care date, and it may not be started before the start of care date. Now, this confusion only comes in when it's a therapy-only patient and the RN is completing the OASIS paperwork. Otherwise, we normally don't have a problem with this. So basically, the nurse cannot see the patient on the day that is prior to when the therapist is seeing the patient. So if the therapist goes to see the patient on Tuesday, the therapist's visit is going to establish the start of care date. That is day zero. So the nurse can go on day zero, which is Tuesday, but they cannot go on Monday. So they can go on day zero, and they can go up to five days later to complete the OASIS. The comprehensive assessment must also accurately reflect the patient's status and must include, at a minimum, the following information, their current health, psychosocial, functional, and cognitive status. So again, psychosocial is new. That was added to Oasis C2. Is there an Oasis D? Again, it's important as a part of the characteristics of patients to be able to document any factors that will impact our patient's uh, plan of care. And you want that on the plan of care because if an auditor is reviewing the plan of care and you're stating that the patient has multiple comorbidities and they're having problems with their medications and under psychosocial, you're identifying that, you know, they have depression or they have anxiety or they can't afford their medications. They have caregiver problems. If you're putting all of this information into your plan of care, it's just going to further augment the reason that the patient needs skilled care. And then the strengths, goals, and care preferences, including information that may be used to demonstrate the patient's progress towards achievement of the goals identified by the patient and the measurable outcomes identified by the agency. So again, on the summary of care tab, um, we don't require these things, but it's in the conditions of participation that we need to identify what is the patient's goal. Maybe my goal as a nurse is that I want them to weigh every day so that they know 
um, if they are as a warning that maybe they're about to go into CHF, but maybe the patient just simply want to stop walking around with oxygen and want to be able to go to their grandson's soccer game um, that they haven't been able to attend in the last three months because of their health condition. So we need to write that down and we need to find out their why and uh, capitalize on that. And likewise, if I am trying to teach my diabetic patient that, you know, maybe you shouldn't eat ice cream, um, and from the beginning, the patient is telling me that I'm never going to stop eating ice cream every day. It's kind of futile for me to have that in my plan of care. So we just need to make sure that we are uh, planning appropriately. And then a continuing need for home health care that should be evident in your documentation, why another visit will need to be performed. And um, even in the skilled care notes, we have to identify why the patient continues to need home health care. And then the medical, nursing, rehabilitative, social, and discharge planning needs. And, of course, we all learned in school discharge planning begins on admission. So um, we do not want to admit patients to home health care and not talk about discharge planning because gone are the days that people can be on home health care for, you know, three to four years the way it used to be in the 90s or what a lot of us call the good old days. We're no longer under utilization. So. So everything is about value-based care, and we need to understand that we are trying to move patients from A to Z, and we need to get them there quickly. As we continue regarding the COPs, also a review of all medications the patient is currently using in order to identify any potential adverse effects and drug reactions, including ineffective drug therapy, significant side effects, significant drug interactions, duplicate drug therapy, and non-compliance with drug therapy. Now, this remains the number one reason for rehospitalizations. And it's no accident that it's a part of the meaningful measures as well as one of the cross-setting measures. So we need to be vigilant about our review of all medications, not just prescriptions, but also herbals and over-the-counter medications that our clients are taking. Now, one of the things that's not in the COPs that I do want to mention, um, because your coders would love it, if you would document for them if a patient is underdosing. Underdosing is a code that we are able to place on the plan of care. Again, it augments the need for skill care. And many times we go into the home and we find maybe the patient is supposed to be taking Lasix 20 milligrams twice a day. They're taking it once a day, either because it makes them go to the restroom too much, they don't have enough money, or they misunderstood the doctor's orders. So anytime a patient is not taking the correct dosage of medication, we can document that as underdosing and place that on our plan of care as well. So the patient's primary caregivers, if any, and other available supports, this is what is supposed to be in the comprehensive assessment, and we have that. It's on the summary of care tab. We have to include their willingness and ability to provide that care their availability and schedules, which are all available for documenting on the OASIS Summary of Care tab and access, which is what I just mentioned, and the patient's representative, if any. So even at intake and as well as in the OASIS document, we give you the ability to identify if the patient has a legal representative or a patient-selected representative. And then, lastly, the comprehensive assessment is supposed to incorporate the current version of the OASIS items using the language and groupings of the items as specified by the secretary. And, of course, we have done that at Access. It's important that you guys understand, again, that the comprehensive assessment is basically the process through which we plan and take care of our patients. The OASIS data items is information that is there for data collection. And the data that we collect is very important because it determines how our agencies will be reimbursed and it also determines 
a lot of the rulings that come down from Medicare because based upon the OASIS data assessments, they're able to understand how nurses actually take care of patients in the home. Another ruling that is important, and this is the last one uh, for completing the OASIS, is the one clinician rule. One clinician takes responsibility for accurately completing the comprehensive assessment. January 2018, the guidance now allows collaboration to answer all OASIS items if the agency policy allows. So if you do not have this in your policy today, please, please update the policy and include this because it's very vital that clinicians are able to actually communicate with one another. If there are any exceptions to the one clinician rule, those exceptions are noted in the specific instructions for each item. So one of the great things is that in the instructions for all of these new questions, it is encouraged. So you don't have to worry about that. I was very excited to see that 28 items were removed from the Oasis D and um, some party poopers are like, yeah, they removed 28, but they added 20 somewhere else. It's not the same. Trust me. When you are going through the assessment, it is great that they remove these 28 items because as you go from tab to tab, um, you will see that a lot of the tabs have less information. And so it's shorter and quicker to get through those tabs. And then they changed seven items. So the seven items that were changed was M1028, active diagnoses, M1306, M1311, M1322, M1324, had what I would call cosmetic changes. And then M2102, type and source of assistance, M2310, reason for emergent care. All right, so let's look at some of these changes. So in M1028, you know, those of you that are on agency court, this is not that much of a change because basically they added here, number three, none of the above. So in Oasis C2, you guys were checking none of the above. It just was not a part of the Oasis question, but now Medicare has added this option there. So now it's a part of the Oasis questions. So again, you have to identify if PBD or diabetes mellitus is active because these influence the functional outcomes or increase the risk for the development or worsening of pressure ulcers. So we must determine if the diagnosis is active, however. So that's from Oasis C2, and we collect this at start of care and resumption of care. So again, uh, with response one, we know that PVD can affect functional outcomes. And so if a patient have any of these diagnoses or these codes, you will want to make sure that you select response one. And then you would select response two. The patient has an active diagnosis of diabetes mellitus if any of these codes are present. Now, in agency core at intake, we give the office the ability to be able to enter the codes for diagnoses to make it easier for the clinicians in the field. So if your office does that and then the nurses actually, you know, order the diagnoses in the OASIS, if you see any of these codes, then you know that you need to check one of those responses. M1306. Now, M1306, what they did was they replaced excludes heel stage 2 pressure ulcers with excludes all healed pressure ulcers. And that makes sense. It doesn't matter what stage. If it's healed, it's healed. And then they added the word injury and injuries to be consistent with the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel terminology. And so on the slides that are coming up, you will see I have circled uh, injury and injuries because um, uh, most of those changes were just revolved around changing that word. Basically, injury refers to, as an example, deep tissue injuries and also stage one pressure injuries. All right, when we look at M1311, M1311, um, there are different versions for a start of care, resumption of care, follow-up versus discharge. So discharge is a little different than the other three time points. 
They updated the terms to align with the NPUAP. So again, injuries um, is there. And then they added the vice after the word non-removable dressing. I guess they recognize that we do have um, things such as wound vax. And so um, now they added that there for clarity. And then they deleted the word suspected in evolution from F1. So it just simply states unstageable deep tissue injury now. So those are just, as I would say, superficial changes to wording. It probably won't affect your practice at all. Now at discharge, this item identifies the number of pressure ulcers or injuries at each stage. And they're talking about stage two, three, and four, and also those that are designated as unstageable that were observed on assessment. At discharge, this item identifies if each pressure ulcer or injury that was present on the discharge assessment was observed at the same stage at the time of the most recent start of care or resumption of care. Stage one pressure injuries and all healed pressure ulcers or injuries are not included in this item. And again, we've already stated they're looking at stage two, three, and four, and those that are designated as unstageable. Medicare also added a dash as a valid response at discharge, but remember this is expected to be very rare. And lastly, it is one of the cross-measure calculations that I mentioned for skin integrity measurement. M1322, again, um, we're looking at a change to the word injury. But this item identifies the presence and the number of stage one pressure injuries. It was removed from the discharge time point to reduce burden, so that's good news. Um, but they also updated the stage one definition and they removed the words, the area may be painful, firm, soft, warmer, or cooler as compared to the adjacent tissue. So they removed those words from the definition. And as a reminder, stage one wounds, although they are closed, they are never considered as healed. So we won't call those healed. M1324 identifies the stage of the most problematic stageable pressure ulcer injury. Pressure ulcer injuries that have healed are not considered for this item. That's kind of common sense. And then pressure ulcers are injuries that are not stageable are not considered. So that's important to know. And an example of that would be DTIs or a wound that's covered by a device or necrotic tissue. So that's not a change from our current practice. In C2, this is already there. And then again, as I stated, we updated the wording from an added injury. 2102. Now, I got a little excited about 2102 because one of the things you will see is that the responses A through G have been removed from the start of care and the resumption of care. So again, see, they have done a lot to reduce the burden. Um, it makes it much easier when you don't have to see that long list on so many tabs. They left supervision and safety at start of care and resumption of care but there is a different version for this item at DC. So when you get to the discharge, um, the items B, E, and G are still removed, but they added ADLs, medication, procedures, and then they kept supervision and safety. So that's still not too bad. M2310, this was exciting as well, because guess what guys, they removed 15 items. That's a lot. This one identifies the reasons for which the patient sought and or received care in a hospital emergency department. Again, it's hospital emergency department. They have not said if they go to care now that you have to count that information here. So I hope you guys are not doing that. They specifically state hospital emergency department. 
they also um, retain just four options. So they're still looking at improper medications. Remember, we talked about that. There's a lot we can do in home health care to prevent that. You know, as a clinician in the field, I don't want patients going to the hospital because I'm not assessing their medications because that's going to uh, reflect upon me and my care. And then hypohypoglycemia, they decided to keep that for diabetes out of control. And then number 19 is for any other reasons than what's above. But as far as rehospitalization is concerned, in agency core, per the conditions of participation, you are able to identify if a patient is at high risk for hospitalization via one of the two assessment tools that we have available for you. It just depends on your preference or your agency's preference um, in which tool you use. To complete the conditions of participation, however, you must choose an intervention to mitigate the risk because the conditions of participation state that you have to identify if a patient is at risk for hospitalization, and then you must have interventions to mitigate the risk. And the purpose is because we don't ever want to have to fill out uh, M2310. And also, I want to make sure you remember that whenever you choose those interventions, that you are going to mitigate the patient's risk for rehospitalization, that the red indicator will be lit up on the clinical notes for coordination of care. And then that way, everyone will know that this patient is at high risk for um, being admitted to the hospital. Now for the new items. In this section, I will review the new items J1800 and J1900. So these are the items regarding um, falls. The GG questions will be discussed in part two of the webinar. Section J, health conditions, takes a look again at the patient's falls and also their injuries. But before we look at the questions, we must first review Medicare's definition of falls because it's not what we may think it is. So first they say the definition is an unintentional change in position coming to rest on the ground, floor, or onto the next lower surface, such as a bed or chair. So again, as a practicing clinician, Several of us, if our patient was standing and then they fell onto the bed, we wouldn't have necessarily called that a fall. Medicare is saying that it is a fall, and we need to count that. So it's just not the patient falling onto the floor, but even onto the next surface. And then they go on to say that the fall may be witnessed or unwitnessed, reported by the patient or an observer, or identified when a patient is found on the floor or ground. And falls are not a result of an overwhelming external force, for instance, a person pushing a patient. And that's important to know because certainly several of us have had patients in assisted livings that probably were on an Alzheimer's ward and another patient pushed one of our patients and the patient ended up with a broken hip. Well, Medicare is stating that that is not a fall. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that we don't count that. Even though the patient fell to the floor due to the push, we're not going to count that. And then they have another definition here that is interesting as well, and it's called intercepted falls. So they say an intercepted fall occurs when the patient would have fallen if he or she had not caught him or herself or had not been intercepted by another person. This is counted as a fall. Okay, so that's going to be tricky because a lot of times in our um, assessments, you know, you go, you see a patient, they're walking in the hall and they're wobbly and uh, they almost fall because they don't have a walker. And we will assess that patient in the uh, MU 1800 section that they are not safe with ambulation. And even though they don't have a walker, we can say that they need a walker. Well, if you say that the patient almost fell while you were there, but you caught them, now you have to document that as a fall, even though it is an intercepted fall. 
And then there are two types of interceptive falls that Medicare also talk about, um, an intentional therapeutic intervention. So they're saying that, that that occurs when challenging a patient's balance and training him or her to recover from a loss of balance they do not want us to count that as an intercepted fall because they expect that that would happen if you were challenging their balance. But they go on to say that if you are performing therapy and you don't anticipate the patient to fall, but you intercept their fall as they're walking with their walker, now we have to count that one as a fall. So again, we have falls and then we have intercepted falls. And so the definition of falls have changed and um, we need to make sure that everyone is counting falls in the same way. So let's look at J1800. J1800 is recent falls since start of care or resumption of care. So this item again identifies if the patient had any witnessed or unwitnessed falls since the most recent start of care or resumption of care. And then the time point for completion of this item is transferred to an inpatient facility, death or discharge not to an inpatient facility. Review the home health medical record. You can also look at the incident reports and any other relevant clinical documentation, for example, fall logs. Um, also, you can interview the patient and or their caregiver about the occurrence of falls. And then let's talk about coding these items. So you would code the, a zero, which is no, if the patient has not had any falls since the most recent start of care or resumption of care. You're gonna code a one for yes, if the patient has fallen since the most recent start of care or resumption of care. And notice Medicare doesn't speak about intercepted falls here, um, or if the patient fell on their bed or on the floor, they just speak of falls. And so we have to know the definitions and make sure that we are counting. And then a dash is a valid response for this item as well, but CMS expects dash use to be a rare occurrence. And um, I do want to say, so let's look at section J1900. J1900 is where we document the injury that's related to the fall. And here's another definition from Medicare. So they say any documented injury that occurred as a result of or was recognized within a short period of time, for example, hours to a few days after the fall and was attributed to the fall. So that would be uh, what they would call an injury. And it's no accident that this is part of our outcomes and quality measures because this statistic is uh, shocking that states every 13 seconds an elderly adult is treated in the ER for falls. Um, I find that very, very shocking. So there is a lot that we are able to do as clinicians in home health care by assessing patients that are at risk and ensuring that they have therapy if they're weak and doing whatever we can to make um, changes in the home to decrease this patient's risk for falls. Then we also received two definitions regarding injury as per the guidance. So one is injury except major. So that includes your skin tears, abrasions, lacerations, superficial bruises, hematomas, and sprains, or any fall that's related injury that causes the patient to complain of pain. So there you will just have to use your clinical judgment. And then major injuries. Major injuries include bone fractures, joint dislocations, closed head injuries with altered consciousness, and then your subdural hematomas. So let's look closely at J1900. So J1900, again, you have your coding to the left, which is none, one, two, or more. And here they're talking about the falls, the number of falls. So you have to identify for no injury versus injury versus major injury. Basically, was this related to one, two, or more falls, or none. So if you had a patient that fell and they did not have an injury, you would just put one there, no injury. One thing that's also important here is that they say 
you must be able to code the type of injury that was related to the fall as well as the number of falls. So that's something a little different than what we are accustomed to. And then you are supposed to count the fall only once and then record according to the worst injury. So what that means is if your patient had a fall and they suffered a skin tear or a laceration, but they also broke a bone, then you would not code injury except major and major injury. You would only code major injury for the bone fracture because a bone fracture, of course, is worse than a skin tear. So that is the difference there. And then we must code a response in each box. So um, if your patient did not have a major injury, you're going to put zero. If they did not have an injury except major, you're going to put zero. And then if they had a fall but they had no injury, then we would put one because you have to be able to code the injury that's related to the fall. I hope that makes sense. Again, what fall did they have and was there an injury? And so you would put none if, it, if there was no injury or an injury except major or a major injury. And then if they had a fall and let's say it was a an injury except major, you would put a number one there. So that's a lot to get started with, but we do have references here for you guys with the OASIS D guidance manual. Um, inside of Access and Agency Core in the OASIS D, we do put the two tips into the OASIS. So you can either, you know, go to the manual online. And again, we have the website here, or you can just simply click on the two tip in your assessment. If you have a question about how to answer something, um, there are also a lot of examples as well that you are able to view. And then the quarterly Q and A's. So I talked earlier about the one clinician rule. If you don't read the quarterly Q&As, you may not be aware of the different changes that come about. So, for instance, with the OASIS D, there are still a lot of questions and things that need to be clarified. So please stay tuned to the quarterly Q&As because I expect that there will be a lot of questions and a lot of great responses there as well. It's our hope that you now understand the reason for the changes to the OASIS data set and that they were driven by the Impact Act of 2014 and that all the important initiatives that are impacting home health care require that we have great documentation. Now, Agency Core is filled with documentation prompts for clinical documentation improvement and success. And I hope you also understand that the changes to the comprehensive assessment are necessary as a part of the conditions of participation regulations. And also that there are not a lot of changes to the OASIS D outside of the green OASIS questions. Um, and those changes include 28 items that have been removed, seven items are changed, and six items are new. So your blue, purple, and gray sections, those sections have not changed. So I think you will be pleasantly surprised and pleased by the OASIS D. I don't think you should be as apprehensive about it, in other words. I hope you also understand that the seven OASIS D item changes, such as the wound changes, the active diagnoses, the emergency room, and the care assistant changes were not changes to how you answer the questions, but that a lot of things were removed or clarified. And lastly, I also hope that you know how to correctly answer J1800 and J1900 falls and injuries. On behalf of Access, thank you for all that you do to make lives so much better for our patients, and we are here to help and assist you in any way that we can. After all, your success is our success. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today and for choosing Access, a provider of innovative, cloud-based software, services, and solutions to help home health organizations improve patient care and grow their business. 
Access is the only healthcare technology company approved to award continuing education credits by the American Nurses Credentialing Center and is also the most recommended home health software on Software Advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our software or at access.com, where you can also find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Thanks again for choosing Access.